Every March, China holds its most influential NPC and CPPCC sessions. But March 2018 is like no other. New leadership, new institutions, constitutional changes, supervision, financial risk, pollution, poverty, a shared future. With China moving towards center stage of the world, President Xi Jinping offers national rejuvenation to the Chinese people. Others worry about Chinese domination. The 2018 two sessions, the National People's Congress and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. What happens here will shape China and perhaps the world. We have access, we go inside, we're closer to China. A prime focus of attention at the 2018 National People's Congress here in Beijing are the amendments to the state constitution. To judge by the whirlwind of Western reactions, one could be forgiven for assuming that the only amendment is abolishing term limits for the president and vice president. In fact, there are more than 20 separate constitutional amendments, all proposed by the party's central committee. And to understand where China is going, one must understand the meaning and intent of the totality of them. These amendments constitute the first changes in well over a decade, so the question must be asked, why now? What is it about China's new era that demands numerous constitutional changes? And that includes term limits. The big picture of the governance of China gets us closer to China. On March 5th, the first day of the 2018 National People's Congress, Wang Chen, Vice Chairman and Secretary General of the NPC Standing Committee explained the constitutional amendments. Amending the Constitution is a big event for the party and the nation's political life. It was a great decision by the CPC Central Committee with Xi Jinping at its core to uphold and develop socialism with Chinese characteristics from an all-inclusive and strategic perspective. It was a major move to implement the rule of law to govern the country and to modernize the country's administrative mechanism and administrative capability. In his 53-minute speech, Wang Chen presented the requirements and principles for drafting the constitutional amendments, explaining their importance. But how did they actually come about? What was the legislative process? I spoke with an NPC delegate, a member of its Legislative Affairs Committee, who was personally involved in the process. He's the former Executive Vice Minister of the Ministry of Justice, and he also participated in the second plenary session of the 19th CPC Central Committee that authorized the amendments, Zhang Sujun. If we look at the amendments to the Constitution, um, there are many different ones. I think there are 21 different uh, uh, um, uh, elements to the uh, amendments, and th they're very different character. Obviously, we have uh, Xi Jinping thought on socialism for Chinese characteristics for a new era, which is the overarching thought that is going into the Constitution. There are some some short phrases that are going in. So, what I'd like to understand is what is the process by which these different elements that all contribute to China's development, but how do all these different elements get put together? What, what's the process involved? To begin with, this amendment can be dated back to early 2017, when a constitutional amendment research group was assembled by the Central Committee. After submitting these 2,000 suggestions, the research results from the Professionals Committee were integrated, and a proposal was drafted and distributed within certain levels of the party. This was then sent to the relevant parties, including related professionals, for further suggestion. On the basis of these further suggestions, there were many modifications, including those proposed by the CPC Central Commission Advisory on Partial Constitutional Amendment Proposal. This advisory proposal was then sent to the second plenary session of the 19th National Congress for review. At the second plenary session, the Central Committee distributed the advisory proposal to all the delegates, with Zhang Zhejiang being the head of the constitutional amendment team assembled by the Central Committee.
Comrade Xi Jinping gave a speech at the first meeting of the second plenary session, outlining the background information and the requirements of the constitutional amendment. After that, all the delegates participated and were divided into different groups for a lively discussion. Every delegate present made a presentation, including myself. During the discussion, eight further suggestions were proposed by the delegates. One of the eight final suggestions was adopted and came into the formation of the final decision, also known as the final decision of the Central Committee regarding partial constitutional amendment. This final decision was voted on by all members of the Central Committee at the closing ceremony. The attending delegates, along with the alternate members, were present at the ceremony and witnessed the voting process. In this way, the second plenary session established the suggestion on modifications. Then, this suggestion was submitted to the NPC Standing Committee and evolved into the published version of the Constitutional Amendment, taking into consideration the suggestions of the second plenary session. The First Amendment inscribes into the state constitution Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era, thus bringing the constitution of the state in line with the constitution of the party in establishing Xi Jinping as the ultimate arbiter of theory and practice in China. Many of the other amendments strengthen the socialist system, the operations of state organs, and the leadership of the party. This linkage is solidified by the revealing statement, the leadership of the Communist Party of China is the most essential feature of socialism with Chinese characteristics. The most essential feature of traditional socialism, of course, is the common or public ownership of the means of production. This transformation epitomizes the theory and practice of China's system today. Another provision memorializes what is now President Xi's mission statement for China's foreign policy, building a community with a shared future for all humanity. The Constitution is the fundamental governing doctrine of China's political and legal system. Here are highlights of the current amendment to the Constitution. Adding, Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. Adding the word reform so that the new phrase becomes in the long years of revolution, construction, and reform. Adding the phrase working to build a community with a shared future for humanity. Adding a sentence that stipulates the leadership of the Communist Party of China is the defining feature of socialism with Chinese characteristics adding a clause that all state officials upon assuming office shall take a public oath of allegiance to the Constitution. The amendment removes from the Constitution the expression that the President and Vice President of China shall serve no more than two consecutive terms. The final highlight is the establishment of a new major institution, the National Supervision Commission, as a new high-level state organ. All of these changes are designed to strengthen China's system of governance, especially the leadership of the party. The theory of inscribing amendments into the Constitution is to strengthen party leadership. How will the current amendments accomplish this? I asked an NPC delegate and legal expert, the president of the All China Lawyers Association, Wang Junfeng. The concept why the Constitution needs to be amended now after 14 years is driven strongly by the concept of we're in a new era that has been defined that because we're in a new era it needs new thinking and new rules new ways of, of organizing things so how do the constitutional amendments as a group reflect the fact that China is now in a new era 
Since China developed very rapidly throughout its reform and opening up process, we have revised the constitution four times in the span of 36 years. I remember that the first revision was in 1988, the second time was in 1993, and the third in 1999. The last time the constitution was amended was in 2004. We can see it will be revised almost every five or six years. The constitutional amendment reflects changes in our national development. It's been very fast. This time, the central government proposed a constitutional amendment. It's been 14 years since the last constitutional revision. The longest time no changes were made to the constitution. The constitution's revision reflects various changes called for by various segments of society. Upholding the rule of law in a country includes respect for everyone, respect for the constitution, and respect for the law. For example, it states all state functionaries shall take a public oath of allegiance to the constitution upon assuming office. This stresses the state's emphasis on the rule of law, including the establishment of a government bound by the rule of law. Every public officer should be able to adopt legal thinking and have a working knowledge of the rule of law. They also include such things as constitutional administration, faithfulness to the constitution and faithfulness to the law. Among the uh, different amendments to the constitution, a cluster of them relate to the party. Uh, a specific statement that the, the party is the leader of the country, um, which is in, obviously in the, in the constitution of the party has now been put in, w will be put into the constitution of the country, um, and a number of other uh, prov provisions uh, of the additions deal with the uh, elements of the party, whether it's socialist values or um, the, uh, the role of the party. Uh, how would you describe those um, parts of the amendments that have to specifically do with the party in terms of putting that into the state constitution. Strengthening party leadership among the people for better governance and politics is a core tenet of the system of socialism with Chinese characteristics. Only through strengthened leadership can we guarantee solid implementation and execution of the policies, regulations and laws issued by the national government. The success of China's reform and opening up over the past few decades are testament to the role of party leadership in achieving these historic milestones. Therefore, in the new era, a further strengthened party leadership will continue to hold tremendous significance and reflect the will and desire of the country's entire population. However, this new era will also bring forth more problems and challenges from home and abroad. On such occasions, only a strong party leadership can pull the will of the whole country and its population for better national development. For a giant country like China, if we do not have a core leadership or if we fail to strengthen the party leadership, it will be very difficult to implement the necessary measures. China is still a developing country, but the last 40 years of miraculous development have boosted our confidence in the leadership of the party and the significance of such leadership to our country. Furthermore, it has enhanced our determination to continue down the political and legal path of socialism with Chinese characteristics. The Western media, no surprise, is focusing on ending term limits. Assuming President Xi will now serve into perpetuity for life, reminiscent of Mao's China. Though abolishing the two-term limit for China's presidency captures headlines, it is more the symbolic final step ratifying Xi's power than the big breakthrough itself. Xi's prior designation as core of the party in October 2016 and inscribing Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era into the party constitution in October 2017 were more meaningful. In a system where the Communist Party is the only ruling party, especially where that party is Marxist and ideology is its basis for being, some say that Xi, as core of the party, and with his name inscribed in the constitutions of both party and state as the contemporary arbiter of Marxism, will be the uncontested, overarching leader of China, irrespective of his formal titles, 
for the foreseeable future. Some say Western experts are confused about the removal of term limits, jumping to the unwarranted conclusion that China's president will now rule the country for life. A China expert at the London School of Economics offers her analysis. I think we're entering that, you know, the Fran uh, Francis Fukuyama pointed, the end of history moment, and um, where the liberal democracy seems to be the, the only model could run a country, and then suddenly uh, China has become a very strange creature, has very much different from any single political system in the world. So it does not fit into the lenses of, so, uh, you know, the, the, the conventional wisdom in the West, and therefore that sense of confusion has caused. For good reasons, Deng Xiaoping initiated the two-term limit provision. Now China eliminates it. What do you think of Clause 14? Well, the whole idea is of putting up the term limits for Deng Xiaoping, you should have looked at it in the historical, historically. You know, back to 1982, China just right after the 10 years of the chaos of Cultural Revolution. And therefore that requires a sense of limit the personal and individual leader's power. And therefore, the shopping come up with the idea of the two-term limits. But now, for the moment, I think we're, if we, I can say, China's in that a cross, a classic crossroads scenario, and whereas you do need to furthering a stronger economic reform, you do need to furthering stronger agenda to run a country properly, and therefore, perhaps, you do actually need a strong pair of hand to give a clear steer to the country. So what you're saying is that for China to move forward into its next stage, uh, it needs a stronger leader? It's not just a strong leader, but uh, I would say rather stronger mandate and stronger and consistent agenda to lead economic reform. As we witnessed in the past, 40 years of economic reform is an unfinished journey, and there's still a lot of l difficulties we need to tackle. So there's a low hanging fruits we have taken already, but what is left behind is those high hanging fruits for some reason, and the party has to really focus on. It helped to, uh, to improve the Chinese economy, but however, I think the, uh, the extent of reform is still not strong enough, and we haven't really seen a fruitful results as what someone expected. So like if you see the mounting debt crisis, and if you see the, the property bubbles, and you also see the capital in flight. So these are the issues which are really on the top priority of the Chinese government. So if I would put the benchmark on how Xi Jinping going to be judged it, um, during his term time, he will be judged by his economic performance. The CPC states that the purpose is national cohesion, brought about when the three top leadership positions, General Secretary of the Party, Chairman of the Central Military Commission, and President of the Republic, are aligned temporarily and held by a single person. But after almost four decades with term limits, there must be more to the change. Advancing reform has become more difficult, with entrenched interest groups resisting change. So the message to resistors is now this. Get on the program, because you can't outwit or outweight President Xi. It is said that only she has the vision, experience, competence, and character to bring about the great rejuvenation of the Chinese people, especially from 2020 to 2035, to bring China to center stage of the world, and that Xi's unimpeded leadership is essential. Since 1982, four revisions have been made to China's constitution each reflecting the developmental stage at the time. In 1998, the amendments acknowledged the legitimacy of the private economy. Individual farmers were allowed to lease or transfer their right to farm a piece of land. In 1993, it was the socialist market economy. In 1999, building a socialist country by law. And in 2004, improving the protection of private property. One of this year's highlights is expanding and institutionalizing the anti-corruption campaign by establishing the National Supervision Law and Commissions. The most important institutional part of the uh, uh, amendments of the Constitution, obviously, is the National Supervision Commission. Um, g give me some sense uh, of the background for that. People are very familiar, of course, with the, the party uh, anti-corruption organ, the Central Commission for Discipline Inspec Inspection, which is a party organ. Now we have this National Supervision Commission. So what's its background? 
Um, how does it articulate with the party uh, CCDI? Uh, so we can begin to understand the importance of this new institution. The next question is about the National Supervision Commission. What is the relationship between the National Supervision Commission with what is commonly known to the public as the Commission for Discipline Inspection? And how can it perform the duty of supervision? One of the most important contents in the constitutional amendment is to establish the national supervision system, which consists of three parts. One comes from the prior Commission for Discipline Inspection. The second comes from the previous administrative supervision, which is part of the supervision system in the State Department, as well as the bureaus of supervision from all levels of the municipal people's government. The the third part is the procuratorate system of anti-corruption, anti-dereliction of duty and the precautionary system of abuse of power crimes. All of these three parts are integrated as a national supervision system. It is, in fact, a joint workforce with the National Supervision System and the National Supervision Commission. Figuratively speaking, it is one task unit under two different names, with a unified functioning mechanism and leadership. The two commissions collectively share the responsibility to supervise party leaders and other officials who have liberty to spend public authority across the nation. It is a full coverage of the supervision both inside and outside the CPC. And this National Supervision Commission uses this structure and shares such a relationship with the Commission for Discipline Inspection. On March 5th, Minister of Supervision Yang Xiaodu explained that the National Supervision Commission is not an organization with vast, far-reaching powers. We don't think the Supervisory Commission is an organ with superpowers. Most of our work is a reminder of the public officers. But no one should doubt our commitment to punishing corrupt officials who are obstinate to go their own way. The scope of our authority will expand, but the number of categories of our responsibilities will not increase. We won't act beyond authorization. In the past, there were holes in our anti graft system. That is the supervision of public officers who are not members of the Communist Party of China and who are not civil servants. Why is now the time for this National Supervision Commission? Uh, the uh, um, uh, attitude against corruption has been with all, all Chinese leaders, uh, really, uh, from the first days. And, and each generation of leaders have had prominent cases that they've uh, brought. Um, uh, and the uh, Central Commission for Discipline and Inspection of the Party has always been the vehicle. Why now is it determined that for the good of the country, this, this, the anti-corruption and, and this, this has to be dramatically expanded, because that's what this is. Why now? Uh, Since the founding of New China, the Party Central Committee has paid much attention to this issue. We can find a very typical case in almost every generation. Why do we need to establish a supervision committee, and why does it become important to strengthen the intensity of anti-corruption campaigns and broaden their expansion? Why now? From my understanding, this is the best time for us to carry out reform of the supervision system. Since the 18th National Congress, with Xi Jinping at the core of the leadership, the CPC Central Commission has carried out a campaign of anti-corruption and has comprehensively strengthened party discipline, taking firm action to bring so-called tigers, flies and foxes to justice. We shall say that we have made historic progress and undergone a paradigm shift in the campaign of anti-corruption. Figuratively speaking, it is addressing the symptoms, not the cause. While we have made a decisive victory in the treatment of the symptoms, the situation remains delicate and complicated and requires follow-up procedures. Under these circumstances, it is important to incorporate the successful experiences, achievements and existing problems into the reform of the supervision system.
With the advantage and basis of an overwhelming tendency of anti-corruption, it is urgent to push reform to the next level, from treating the symptoms to treating the cause. So at this point, it's been proposed to revise the supervision system and consolidate the results of treating the symptoms of corruption. It also serves a purpose to push the anti-corruption campaign more comprehensively and effectively. Deepening the campaign will switch from treating the symptoms that people dare not commit corruption into a mechanism guaranteeing no corruption. If we were going to be sitting here 20 years from today or at 2050 in mid-century and looking back at this group of, of constitutional amendments, what would we be able to say from the future looking back on, on how important these were in, um, in enabling China to continue its uh, remarkable development? I believe the influence will be absolutely profound. First, Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era, which is also the guiding ideology of the party, will be listed as the guiding ideology that China's 1.3 billion people must abide by. This will bring the whole population together and encourage them to work to achieve the Chinese dream of realizing the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. In addition, in this constitutional amendment, the country's governance system and governance methods have been adjusted in various ways. In particular, the establishment of such a monitoring system will further improve the country's political power structure and the formation of state institutions. The original methodology of one government with people's procuratorate and people's court shall be changed into one government with national supervision commission, people's procuratorate and people's court, which makes the country's governance more complete and at the same time more efficient, which can lead to long-term peace and stability of the country and make sure that we all follow the path of socialism with Chinese characteristics steadily, efficiently and rapidly. In a phrase, the constitutional amendments are all about strengthening China's system of governance, especially the party's leadership of the country and President Xi's leadership of the party and the country. Xi has been consistent in respecting, indeed in championing, China's constitution. And now, amending the constitution, he enhances alignment between the realities of how China is actually governed and what the Constitution actually says, thus bolstering Xi's commitment to the rule of law. Establishing the National Supervisory Law and Commissions, expanding the anti-corruption campaign to all public organs and organizations is also consistent. As for term limits, it is not that Xi will hold the formal titles of leadership for life, but that he will hold real leadership long enough to bring about China's national rejuvenation and establish a Chinese kind of democratic norms. Xi's grand vision for mid-century China, China 2050, is for the country to be prosperous, strong, democratic, culturally advanced, harmonious, and beautiful. All factors considered because of China's special conditions and Xi's special capabilities, abolishing term limits may be good for China. I'm trying to be closer to China.